So the next thing I want to talk about is evidence for the design of the universe. This stuff has been developed since about the 1980s. There's a scientific principle now called the Anthropic Principle. You may have heard about it. The definitive book on the Anthropic Principle, I brought it with me in case anybody wants to read it. It's called the Anthropic Cosmological Principle. It's rather thick, small print, lots of mathematics. I know PhDs who've struggled through this book, including myself. And so I don't recommend it. But it's a very good book. Okay? It's a great book. And in this book, uh, astronomer John Barrow and physicist Frank Templer mention over 100 examples of physical constants that have been fine-tuned to allow the universe exist, to exist. Since we don't have too much time, I'm not going to list all 100 examples for you. But I will list a few. Okay? The fine-tuning of the physical universe. The first is the amount of matter and energy in the universe. Let's talk about matter in particular. When the universe first expands at the begin at the beginning, at the beginning of the Big Bang, if there's too much matter in the universe, uh, matter is attracted to each other by gravity. So, by the way, if you're ever on a date, you know, you can really say I'm attracted to you, and it's true, because we're all attracted to each other, all right? So everything with matter is attracted to each other, and if there's too much matter, in a few million years, the universe collapses, we have no humanity. If there's too little matter, what happens is the universe expands so quickly that um, stars and galaxies can't form. Nothing can actually coalesce. We don't have any life. And the amount of matter is precisely tuned in the universe to one part in 10 to the 60th. Paul Davies writes, oh, let me give you these terms. Rho is the amount of matter in the universe. It's the Greek symbol we use. Rho critical is the exact amount of matter you need, basically, to have the universe we live in. And Paul Davies writes, to choose Rho so close to Rho critical, fine-tuned to such stunning accuracy, is surely one of the great mysteries of cosmology. If the crucial ratio had been 10 to the minus 57th, rather 10 than 10 to the minus 60th, the universe would not even exist, having collapsed to oblivion after just a few million years. In their book, Cosmic Coincidences, cosmologists John Gribbon and Martin Rees write this. If this, talking about the matter density in the universe, if this were a coincidence, then it would be a fluke so extraordinary as to make all other cosmic coincidences pale into insignificance. The next thing about design I want to tell you about is the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is what I study. I now work at the Fermi National Laboratory near Chicago. I study the interaction between quarks inside the proton, and that's the strong nuclear force. If it were only 5% weaker, then only hydrogen would be stable. Now, that would make chemistry class a breeze. You go in there, <laughs> hydrogen, all right? <laughs> but it's not so good for us. And if that's 5% weaker, if it's 2% stronger, then you have all heavy elements forming. You know, the highest naturally occurring element is uranium. But if you make it, hot, make it stronger, then you get all these other things occur, and they are, have radioactive properties that basically are very destructive to higher life forms like ourselves. So this is finely tuned. This is an amazing discovery that was made back in the um, 80s, I think, 70s or 80s. Uh, in order to have life like we know of, we have to have stars that burn stably and consistently over billions of years. And a guy named Brandon Carter did some calculations to determine what it took for stars to burn stably and consistently. All right, so if you're not a math person, close your eyes, all right? I want to give you two numbers. One is called the gravitational coupling constant. Basically, it's how strong is gravity. Another is the electromagnetic coupling constant. I'm a physicist. I've got to get some equation in the talk, all right? It's electromagnetic coupling constant. It's basically how strong is electromagnetism. What Brandon Carter showed is in order for stars like our sun to be able to exist, to burn stably, you have to have this equation, that the coupling constant of gravity is greater than or equal to the coupling constant of electromagnetism to the 12th power times the mass of the electron divided by the mass of the proton to the 4th power. That that has to be true or there are no stars like our sun. When you put the numbers in, you get a number that's extremely small, but slightly bigger than another extremely small number. Okay. Um, finally, the formation of carbon. We're all made of carbon. It's an amazing thing. You know where the carbon in your body came from? Anybody know? Stars. We really are stardust. And when supernova explode, supernova go through this process that creates carbon. It's an amazing process. Two helium. You know, I've never actually told the process when I gave this talk. And I was thinking last night, this is Stanford. You know, I could probably tell them the process. But, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Let's say this. There's an amazing process that goes on that requires nuclear resonances. If it wasn't for those nuclear resonances, resonances of beryllium, resonances of carbon, and resonance of oxygen, we would, have, we would either have no carbon 
or just oxygen, or just brilliant. And scientists are amazed at the fine-tuning. Oh, I know, I got another cool picture. That's a supernova, since we all came from supernovas. All right. And this is what Owen Ginnerich says about this process that created carbon. carbon. He's an astronomer who won the Crawford Prize, which is like the Nobel Prize in astronomy. Had the resonance level in the carbon been 4% higher, there would be essentially no carbon. Had that level in the oxygen been only half a percent higher, virtually all the carbon would have, have been converted to oxygen. Without that carbon abundance, neither you nor I would be here tonight. So again, you take a number, you take the way the universe works, you tweak it 4%, we don't exist. You tweak it a half percent the other way, we don't exist. And over and over, there are hundreds of these things that say over and over, if you tweak the universe a little bit, we don't exist. Well, maybe you can tweak it enough and change enough things that we could still exist. This is what Fred Hoyle says. By the way, Fred Hoyle was the guy that came up with the idea, the term, the Big Bang, and it was a derogatory term. He said, I don't believe the universe began in a Big Bang. And he wrote this, but such properties seem to run through the fabric of the natural world like a happy thread of coincidence. That's my favorite phrase, a happy thread of coincidences. <laughs> but there are so many odd coincidences essential to life that some explanation seems required to account for them. So many odd coincidences. Gribben and Reese write, if we modify the value of one of the fundamental constants, something invariably goes wrong, leading to a universe that is inhospitable to life as we know it. When we adjust a second constant in an attempt to fix the problems, the result generally is to create three new problems for every one that we solve. The conditions in our universe really do seem to be uniquely suitable for life forms like ourselves, and perhaps even for any form of organic complexity. So what are the theological implications of all this? Well, Barrow and Tipler wrote this book. The Anthropic Cosmological Principle. And they saw the design of the universe. And, um, but they're, they're atheists, basically. There's no God. And they go through some long arguments to describe why humans are the only intelligent life in the universe. That's what they believe. And so they got a problem. If the universe is clearly a product of design, but humans are the only intelligent life in the universe, who creates the universe? So you know what Barrow and Tipler's solution is? That makes perfect sense. Humans evolved to a point someday where they reach back in time and they create the universe for themselves. <laughs> hey, these guys are respected scientists. So what brings them to that conclusion? It's because the evidence for design is so overwhelming that if you don't have God, you have humans creating the universe back in time for themselves. Fred Hoyle wrote, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics, as well as with the chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about nature. Hoyle is an agnostic, or an atheist, I'm pretty sure. I know at least agnostic. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Paul Davies wrote this, if physics is the product of design, the universe must have a purpose, and the evidence of modern physics suggests strongly to me that the purpose includes us. So, all these agnostic and atheistic scientists who've studied carefully the origin and design of the universe recognize that the current scientific discoveries require there's a super intellect behind it all. The scientific evidence has driven them to this conclusion that the universe must be designed and constructed precisely for humans that the purpose includes us. Unfortunately, I think the scientists have missed the most obvious candidate for the super intellect who has monkeyed with the physics, who has a purpose for humanity. Because for millennium, long before Davies and Hoyle wrote, the Bible's declared that exact same thing. Hoyle's super intellect, Davies' purpose that includes us, perfectly de describes the God of the Bible. David wrote millennia ago, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? What is it that makes humans unique when I consider the heavens? Zephaniah wrote, God will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you. The universe has a purpose, and that purpose includes us. Don't miss the point. Scientists who are agnostic or atheists themselves have come to con the conclusion that there must be a transcendent intelligence and designer involved in the universe that includes humani humanity as an intricate part of the purpose. 